Friends of Cancer Research started with these two friends, Ellen Siegel and Marlene Malek. In 1996, while serving together on the National Cancer Advisory Board, their shared experience and commitment to change motivated them to create a partnership that would stand the test of time. They were animated by personal loss to find a new, better way forward for cancer research, one that centers on both finding effective treatments for cancer and ensuring patient choice and quality of life. With the clock ticking for so many patients, the mission of Friends became clear and patience would be at its core. The current process wasn't working and we were tired of waiting, so Friends found a way to bring people together and take action, to use expertise to find out what wasn't working for patients and change it, and make those solutions find their way to patients at the bedside as quickly as possible. This was a transformational approach. Friends would do more than raise awareness. We tackled the challenge head on by uncovering areas of research and driving that research forward, identifying problems that aren't being addressed and addressing them, finding complex issues that have become roadblocks and solving them. No one had ever done it this way and the momentum it created made an impact almost immediately. From our first breakthrough, Friends has been pushing the field forward through innovative approaches to research, patient-centered care, and policy priorities. Through every policy passed, therapy approved, and scientific advancement, patients continue to be the heart and soul of our work. We've built the momentum. The question is, what's next? We'll continue groundbreaking collaborations. We are also pursuing difficult, important scientific endeavors answering questions that will inform the next generation of patient care. As we look ahead, we're not slowing down. We're just getting started. Good afternoon, I'm Jeff Allen, President and CEO of Friends of Cancer Research, and welcome to this year's Friends of Cancer Research Annual Meeting. We're excited to have you join us today and tomorrow as we bring together leaders in the field to address pressing issues in oncology research and drug development. As you saw in our video kicking off the event, this year is the organization's 25th anniversary, and we're proud to be celebrating the progress made over the past 25 years. I want to thank all of our collaborators that have helped drive that progress through partnerships over those years. This includes the key leaders that you'll hear from over the next two days, including the members of the working groups, that helped develop the white papers for this year's annual meeting. Today's session will help us set the course for extending work already underway regarding circulating tumor DNA. The CT Monitor Project, step two, is bringing together 12 different companies that are providing data from 36 clinical trials to help characterize the role of CT DNA in monitoring treatment response. Please visit our website for more information. Building on that, Today, we'll be discussing key clinical and regulatory questions about how ctDNA measures could be applied in early disease settings. But first, to start today's meeting, I'd like to hand things over to Friends founder and chair, Dr. Ellen Siegel, for an opening keynote discussion with Dr. Janet Woodcock, Acting Commissioner of the FDA. Thank you, Jeff. Janet? You have been through it all, the pandemic, warp speed, and now vaccines. Before I ask my first question, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks, Ellen, and it's great to be here with everyone. Well, we are incredibly appreciative for all your hard work and all that you've done. You are really a hero. Uh, so let's talk about something that I know you are passionate about, have always been passionate about and continue, and that's about um, clinical trials and, and, and meaningful trials in the community. Uh, and really recently you discussed, and I'll say it, crappy clinical trials and what to do. What do you mean and how do we fix it? The big issue is we know we have to do better, but what are some of the reasons? And more importantly, what are the fixes for these clinical trials? Well. What we mean by that when we say small trials 
is, for example, in COVID, we published on this at the FDA and showed that in the United States and actually worldwide, probably only five, six percent of the trials were capable of yielding actionable information. And even some of those that set out to do that didn't enroll adequately. So basically, people need to work together to do doing small fragmented trials doesn't yield to progress for patients. It doesn't change the standard of care. It doesn't change guidelines. It doesn't uh, result in F FDA recommendations or other regulators. So for a long time, uh, you and I and many other people have been working on master protocols as one solution to this. That means that people have to work together instead of having isolated trials. Right now, the vast majority of trials are either NIH-sponsored trials at academic medical centers or sponsored by industry, the, the um, medical products industry, and often those are at CRO sites. Now, neither of those groups really are reaching the vast majority of people. And in fact, what, that's what we saw with COVID. Uh, we had major medical centers where we couldn't enroll people in the trials, and yet their subsidiary hospitals out in the community actually were stuffed with people uh, in the hospital, and yet we couldn't enroll them because they didn't participate in clinical research and they didn't have study personnel, for example, and experience. So recently I published with some other folk in the New England Journal a perspective article. And what we said there is what we really need to do is take this seriously, both the industry and um, the government funders need to make sure that we enlist community practitioners in all disparate communities as clinical researchers. And then we will be able to reach those populations that typically don't have any access to clinical research right now. So do we need to we need to train them? Do we need to change incentives or have requirements from both the NIH industry and the FDA? Are, are there carrots and sticks? That well, we you know, have? I think what people have focused on is sort of the quota system in trials. We want to have this many of these people and we this many of these people. And that was meritorious, right? But Really, we want to be able to reach out to people where they get their usual care. And so I think uh, what we propose is that there needs to be support for those uh, uh, community uh, practitioners who wish to participate in research. They need protected time. They need support from a specialized kind of CRO that helps them with all the procedures, the study personnel, and so forth. And they need to be reimbursed for their uh, participation because they aren't going to get a benefit from having their name on a paper if they're out practicing in impoverished communities, rural communities. That's really not going to do much for them. Uh, so we need to take this seriously and provide training, reimbursement, protected time, and really reach out to those uh, communities. Can we do frontline trials in a community as well? We've talked about that a lot through the lung map program and work with NIH on that. Is that, do they have the training or is that too risky or is that another um, whole other complicated issue? Well, I think we need to walk before we run. Um, basically, I think the figure right now is that only 8% of cancer patients, you may know better than I, uh, are offered participation in a clinical trial, at least adult. Uh, cancer patients in the United States. We need to do a lot better than that. And there's so many questions with precision medicine and so forth that need large numbers of people enrolled to answer those questions. And so um, I think it could, we could get there over time, but first uh, those folks aren't even being offered the um, ability to participate as clinical researchers right now. And so they need training support, as I said, protected time and so forth. And we have to take this seriously.
Well, we do, we have to make it happen because those patients are most in need and with the least access. Um, now I'm gonna switch over to real world data, um, digital health tools, what you need to trust it and use it so we can feel comfortable with, with them when we have compelling urgent needs, how we how we use it moving forward because we all care about it. But, but it's a big world and very complicated and how, where do we start and how do we do it, particularly when we have urgent needs like COVID or a pandemic or just frankly urgent needs to find to where we can only use this data. Well, I think the United States is somewhat disadvantaged there because of our healthcare system being so fragmented. And we see the use of many different kinds of uh, electronic health records. And they, um, even within the same electronic health records, say the laboratories use different standards and there isn't standardization. And so it's really hard to get to a single source of truth and have that be something that is repeatable across investigators, across sites, and so forth, you know, across clinicians, across sites. So um, that I think is one of the major challenges we have. That said, we are using uh, real world evidence. Um, registries are one way that, um, for example, the rare disease community is working to construct natural history. Registries um, impose more uh, um, rigor upon the data that are entered and therefore they're uh, more reliable and more analyzable. Um, <clears throat> in addition, people are working with, with other types of efforts to uh, like one source, you know, to make sure that uh, the critical information in the electronic health record is actually correct. Um, so I think these pilots and efforts will come together over time, but especially in the United States, it's going to take patience. The FDA has used real world evidence for approvals. Um, for synthetic control groups, for understanding um, current natural history with current uh, therapies and so forth. So um, this is starting to filter into the regulated environment, but it's slow on the efficacy side because of the problems that I've just mentioned. Well, I'm glad. I mean, we all know it's important, but it has to be, I guess, rigorous enough and most of all trusted. So this is yes. a, so now I'm going to pivot to something that I know you care about deeply, something that we do and I do and all of us. And that comes to regulatory environment and innovation. We have um, not skipped a beat during COVID, and it has been incredibly uh, taxing on everyone, and certainly all those at the FDA, and certainly the entire community has really, um, you know, paid a huge price. But on the other hand, in science, we go forward, and we care about innovation and precision medicine. And um, how do we get ready for that? What is the agency doing for that? And how do we get into serious or real and of ones, how how do we move forward with that? And what training, what skill sets do we need to really realize the real promise of uh, precision medicine? Well, I do think that it's going to uh, take um, thinking differently than we have. If you think of the sweep of regulation from this 1962 amendments where we first decided that we'd have actual scientific evidence of effectiveness. And then we got into the area, you're always doing two clinical randomized controlled trials with certain p-values. And then you move into the uh, era of now where we're seeing um, more use of surrogate endpoints. There's much more science, uh, scientific evidence available to bolster the clinical information. Um, we need, probably some successes in the end of one. I think FDA has opened the door there uh, to um, developing these unique uh, targeted treatments, end of one or end of a small handful. Um, but we still, um, they haven't been that successful, all right? And we need some successes in this area to kind of carry us forward. I think science is just, uh, it's changing so fast. Um, 
that it's difficult to incorporate it all into our thinking. And we, there's still so many unknowns. But I think one of the biggest challenges is the success rate, uh, which has been much better, I think, in the area of precision medicine and targeted therapy. But we still can't pick the winners, right? And we still have to do a clinical evaluation. And we're still surprised a lot of times because we don't understand all the variables. So I think the advancement of biological science and the better understanding of human biology and pathogenesis is one thing that'll help us, but at the same time, then we need to um, make sure uh, as regulators, we're um, able to assimilate and process that totality of evidence. It's the complexity of, of science and safety and innovation. And I assume that's the same for cell therapy and gene therapy. You know, we're all excited about it and anxious to have it and um, just want to make sure we're ready for it um, because the, of the promise of, of cures. Right. Janet, as a result of COVID, what regulating regulatory changes, what have we seen? What is changing as a result of what we've experienced going forward? It would be really important to understand the learnings from COVID and the lessons. Well, one of the things we've all learned is that we can do a lot more things remotely than we thought, right? And because we had to move ahead with clinical trials and we couldn't just stop everything while we were, um, isolated and socially distanced, a lot has been learned about our remote televisits, uh, different ways to monitor patients. I think in the future, this may end up being much more convenient for patients if they don't have to show up for so many visits and take so much time out of their uh, day. So those types of things, different ways to get informed consent using um, telehealth uh, a lot more, I think uh, that will uh, continue forward and really improve the efficiency of clinical trials. One of the things FDA is experimenting with, which is very interesting, is um, remote assessments of manufacturing facilities and uh, audits of clinical trials and so forth. In some cases, we might have one uh, auditor wearing a camera or maybe an employee of the firm and going through um, different records or looking at manufacturing lines and looking into coroners and inspecting things. And we are working on that because, of course, we're still very limited in certain parts of the world that we can visit. So I believe a lot of things will change. And one of the most interesting things to me is that FDA, uh, much of FDA is still working remotely and we we're very successful in doing that and very productive. And so I think the new normal of even the kind of work that we do is going to change and be different. Wow, I mean, it is really an extraordinarily complicated time and um, great thank you to you and the entire team at FDA for all that you've done and are doing, getting us through this pandemic, getting us treatments, getting us vaccines, getting us diagnostics, while continuing to uh, create innovation and other uh, areas that are really important for, uh, for uh, patients. Uh, enormous gratitude to you, Janet, for your hard work. Well, I thank you. It's been a heavy lift, and it's been a heavy lift for the entire uh, agency, but the staff of FDA are so dedicated to the public health they just basically rose to the challenge and they're still doing it. They're getting the work done. I think uh, people are getting tired, but uh, we're, we're making it happen because it, we, we need to. And both for the pandemic, um, another problem that we experienced, which has been talked about a lot, is all the supply chain problems. That's not going away. It actually seems to be getting worse now again. Um, and um, both all the medical product centers, even the food center, were all working on the supply chain problems that have been caused by this pandemic and are kind of resonating down through time and, and are still problematic. But I do think yeah, the FDA staff has just stepped up and done a fantastic job in responding to this crisis. 
Well, we're enormously grateful. Janet, thank you again for all you're doing. I appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are and everybody is, and it is deeply appreciated. Well, Ellen, thank you. And thanks to friends for all the work you're doing and your relentless advocacy for patients and for innovation to really advance the care and outcomes for patients. So thank you very much. And it was my pleasure. Thank you. Deeply appreciated. Thank you very much. Now, as we dive into the main session for today's meeting, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Hellman, medical oncologist and lung cancer specialist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, who has been a thought leader regarding the use of CTDNA and an advisor to the CT Monitor Project to help lay the framework for today's discussion. Good morning. It is such a treat to be here with you all to talk about this really important topic related to bringing CTDNA into the clinic as a tool for both clinical uh, research as well as clinical care of patients with cancer. So thank you so much to the Friends of Cancer Research for the invitation to be here uh, for your annual meeting here. Um, and uh, certainly this is an important part of the overall theme related to getting better cancer treatments to patients quickly. The hypothesis, which I, I hope is not a particularly controversial hypothesis, but is that I believe CTDNA will be a critical and ultimately routine decision-making tool for clinical care and clinical research and drug development and oncology. And the reason for that is it gives us really unparalleled opportunity to interrogate the in vivo disease state, which is what is happening in the context of a cancer at a given time in a person. Um, and there's so many different applications of that, some of which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about today. But the, the sort of the unifying principle of what makes CTDNA so powerful is that ability to both detect and interrogate so that you can both see it, but also there's actual science that you can get uh, from being able to examine this, this sort of lived experience of what's happening with a tumor at a given moment. There are, of course, multiple applications of CTDNA, and it's worthwhile to highlight how even though there is this common value around the ability to bring precision to what's happening in the in vivo disease state of a cancer at a given time, each of these individual states or applications uh, might require different um, uh, assays and optimization and um, uh, ultimate uh, tools. Uh, different tools might be needed in these different settings. In broad terms, I think there's at least four major uh, scenarios in which we have to sort of bring CTDNA into uh, uh, how we make innovation for cancer treatments in the future. One of them is in screening, is trying to find cancer at its earliest form for the sake of early detection, to find cancers at earlier stages of disease, which has been so crucial to the successes we've had with mammography screening and colorectal cancer screening, where cancers are found in much earlier stages, ones in which they can be cured. So ultimately, that goal is to be able to increase the cure rate uh, of patients with cancer. Even at a later stage of disease, at the time in which it's found, those CTDNA can also be crucial in those early dynamics of what's happening in a new adjuvant setting and afterwards. Afterwards, when a cancer has been resected or radiated, is one of the most vexing clinical scenarios that we face in clinic all the time. It's like, is this cancer gone and cured for which no more treatments needed? Or is there persistent tumor that more treatment is absolutely needed to try and maximize the opportunity for cure? And this is a space in which our radiologic tools currently don't have the capacity to give us insight. It's a unique opportunity for CTDNA to, to contribute novel insight in whether or not there is residual disease or whether a patient's cured, to contribute new populations for regulatory pathways of patients that still have residual disease. And fortunately, there's something that you can monitor. There's this detectable CTDNA that can serve as an endpoint as well. Another space that I think is incredibly attractive and already beginning in many studies is in this early on-treatment dynamics in patients with metastatic disease. And some of this contributes to sort of just the pace with which you can get a readout on whether or not a drug is working. So the opportunity to build new endpoints in the earliest points of uh, treatment settings could substantially increase the, efficient, the efficiency of our clinical trials and our go no go decisions for whether a given drug is actually effective or quantifying the degree of effectiveness. For me personally, the stable radiologic disease is a place in which 
I think CTDNA has a tremendous opportunity to bring some clarity as to whether or not a patient is actually responding to a given medicine or not. And then the later stages of disease, there's also the opportunity for long-term tracking which can determine whether or not a patient might even be cured by some treatments such as immunotherapy, which has the potential to create cures in the context of metastatic disease. But also in those patients that have persistent uh, detectable cancer, this might be a place for innovation on in which therapeutics can be added on to maximize both the depth of response, durability of response, and with some hope, some uh, desire for maybe even cures in the metastatic setting. I think it can also be an opportunity to personalize treatment duration. If you know the, the, the depth of response or the persistence of response uh, and predicting and interrogating resistance when it happens, all of these are, are potential tools. And so the common value across all of these settings is to bring precision into the clinical care of patients. We talk about precision a lot in terms of genetics and then therapeutics and mechanism of action, but we need precision in our patients too. What is actually happening to a given patient at a given time and whether a treatment is responding is a remarkably crude practice sometimes. And so innovation on how well um, a patient's responding is desperately needed. And this can inform both clinical practice as well as therapeutic breakthroughs. But as I mentioned in the beginning, that each of these settings also can have the unique, uh, both challenges and uh, necessities. And so it should not be framed as a one-size-fit-all tool, but one in which a given tool and a given analyte uh, should be optimized for uh, these specific applications and so that it can be most effective. In the context of this sort of just introductory talk, I wanted to focus on just two pieces of this um, paradigm where there's um, active progress on uh, bringing CTDNA into the clinic. In the adjuvant setting, the most uh, recent progress has been towards this transition between a prognostic finding that if CTDNA is present in the definitive setting, that is a very bad prognostic feature for the likelihood of relapse. And this was just one example from Max Dean's group at Stanford in looking at early stage lung cancers that had um, already had definitive therapy and then determine whether CTDNA could be detected. And you can see this very early, very dramatic dichotomization of uh, whether or not a patient was cured or was destined for relapse. And um, so this is just an example of how it can be so prognostically important. But of course, the goal here is towards precision intervention. The next example is in the context of patients with bladder cancer treated with adjuvant atezolizumab. And here was one of the very first examples where knowing information about the CTDNA status in the adjuvant setting could determine whether or not a given drug was both necessary and effective. So in the patients that had no uh, detectable CTDNA at the top, there was no difference between whether you got atezolizumab or the placebo. But in the patients that had detectable CTDNA, there was this clear and stark difference but in the benefit of patients who are getting atezolizumab. And so this is the precision of how do you get the right drugs to the right patients? This group of patients, clearly many of them didn't need any adjuvant therapy, but we didn't know that at the time. We didn't have a tool to be able to detect who needed and who didn't. And so it's clear that this has the opportunity to provide precision. Unfortunately, there are new trials of which these are just two examples, but are trying to bring this into a prospective intervention. We're in these, these two mermaid studies from AstraZeneca where you take patients either right after surgery or after they completed the full definitive course of treatment and test whether they have minimal residual disease. And those are the patients be tested uh, and treated. And so the, the idea here is to say, if in detecting these patients who have minimal residual disease, can we maximize the benefit of our adjuvant interventions and maximize the likelihood that we cure more and more patients, a greater fraction of patients, while simultaneously avoiding unnecessary toxicity in patients that don't need it. The second setting that I wanted to highlight here is a space in which Friends of Cancer Research has been a clear leader. And that's uh, in the metastatic on-treatment setting where the CT monitor project has been bringing together so many stakeholders, like at this meeting uh, today, um, to harmonize the variety of data assets that are available into, can we, as early as possible, see a signal of uh, benefit or non-response with using um, uh, lung cancer and PD-1 blockade as sort of an, a paradigmatic example in step one, but of course, extending to many other settings in step two and beyond. And so, so many of the partners are here and I just feel very thankful for so many people that have collaborated successfully uh, with uh, Friends of Cancer Research leadership towards bringing this into the reality. 
And so some of the results from step one that have been shared before focused on that idea of how can we harmonize so many different assays all together to bring some commonality to some of the conclusions. And some of those conclusions are in some ways intuitive, but hopefully reassuring. And what this results then show us is a, a blueprint of how to do this. But the idea was that reductions of varying degrees in terms of ctDNA concentration and variant allelic frequency associate with clear outcomes. And so these different groups in the Kaplan-Meier curve over to the right represented a clustering of a variety of different data sets wherein patients that had a strong decrease in their ctDNA levels did substantially better than those who had a strong increase, while the intermediates were intermediate. And so I think that this is a very clear indication of what many sources of data are suggesting that ctDNA can provide a reliable in vivo assessment of what's happening with the cancer under uh, selective pressure from treatment. As um, this project moves forward into step two, um, some of the next pieces include both expanding the number of scenarios around which this tool could potentially be applied. In lung cancer, we've, step one had focused on the uh, PD-1 setting, uh, but there's other uh, important treatment settings like with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, as well as across a variety of other different tumor types that might require some distinct parameterization, both for the disease type and the treatment type. And the key question is, one, how early and can early ctDNA changes ultimately predict the long-term benefit of, um, of new therapies? I think this can provide extraordinary efficiency in our clinical trials to inform and refine our go, no-go decisions for clinical development, and ultimately be a tool that's routinely used in clinics so that the earliest, best treatment strategies are applied to patients with more clarity. And so, uh, in conclusion, I anticipate, my own personal anticipation and bet is that ctDNA will be a transformative tool for clinical care and clinical research. I think it provides new populations, more precise populations that are, get the best drugs to the people who need it most. It gives us faster answers and new ways of being able to refine whether or not a given drug is working, should be discontinued or accelerated. And it provides a new strategy around which new interventions can come. Those interventions can sometimes be accelerating so that we're adding on new treatments in patients that aren't otherwise seeming to go the right direction, but doing that as early as possible to maximize the potential effect. Some of those interventions can also be de-escalating. For example, in patients that have long-term responses to immunotherapy, ctDNA may well be the tool by which we're able to stop treatment safely and comfortably and confidently in patients who don't need it. And that can be you know, tremendous knock-on effects in terms of both toxicity, quality of life, and cost. But of course, there's important work to be done here, and that's part of the reason that everyone is here today, because there's many issues that remain in terms of how these assays can be safely and effectively integrated in both our research and clinical settings. Those include having the maximal sensitivity of the assays to determine whether that uh, detectable ctDNA has been eradicated. Other issues have been that there can be potential contaminants of what otherwise might seem like somatic variants. Otherwise, knowing sort of how much does ctDNA change on an hour-to-hour -hour basis so that we're not making the wrong conclusions from basically what's noise, and many others that I'm sure people will talk through at length today. The task is substantial, and then the benefit is even greater. And so with that sort of goal in mind, the clear path to success here is through everyone working together. And so this is, of course... The, the theme and the spirit of the meeting and something that Friends of Cancer Research has cultivated um, and you all have come sincerely to, to bridge. So with that spirit, then we should move forward and um, excitedly because I think this will be part of our future. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, that was a fantastic presentation and really sets up the panel discussion nicely. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kathy Winson. I am an executive group director in regulatory at Genentech and Roche, and I'm honored to be moderating today's panel discussion on charting the path for ctDNA as an early endpoint in early stage disease. As you just heard from Matthew, ctDNA is a really promising tool in both clinical research and in the clinical care of cancer patients. And as Matthew highlighted in his presentation, and, and Jeff actually mentioned this at the beginning of the meeting, 
Friends has been leading a multi-phase collaborative effort to assess and help establish the utility of CTDNA in the metastatic setting through the CT Monitor project. The current effort, um, the focus of today's discussion, specifically the uh, working in early stage disease, will really be able to leverage the foundation that was established as part of the ongoing CT Monitor project. This more collaborative approach um, will allow us to better understand how CTDNA can be leveraged in early stage disease and potentially and really hopefully accelerate establishing CTDNA as an early endpoint in this setting. So um, before we begin the discussion today, I would like to introduce uh, our esteemed panel of experts that are going to be talking to you today. So I'm just going to go around um, with the introductions. I'm going to start with uh, Chris Abash. Chris is a fellow at AstraZeneca and a principal clinical fellow at the University College London. Next, we have Elsa Anagnostu, who is an associate professor of medical oncology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she also ser serves as the director of the Thoracic Oncology Biorepository and co-leader of the Johns Hopkins Molecular Tumor Board. Next, we have Jonathan Baden. John is the senior director of translational sciences and diagnostics at Bristol Myers Squibb. We have from the FDA, Rena Phillips, who is the Director of the Division of Molecular Genetics and Pathology at FDA Center of Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH. Mark Sousen. Mark is the Vice President of Technology Innovation at Personal Genome Diagnostics. And our last panelist, Paz Valenki, is a medical oncologist and acting team lead for one of the thoracic and head and, head and neck cancer teams within FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR. So welcome to all of our panelists, and I'm going to jump right into the discussion now because we have a lot of questions for our panelists. And we're going to go ahead and start with just talking about the use case. Um, how did we come up with this use case? As Matthew talked about, um, there's some really exciting opportunities and a lot of use cases involving CTNA. And, but the white paper uh, specifically focuses on a single use case, and that is establishing CTDNA as an early endpoint, in early stage disease. So I'm going to ask Chris, Chris, if you can get us started and maybe elaborate on why the group focused on this particular use case and endpoint and and from the group perspective and also from, um, you know, maybe an industry perspective, why is this important or valuable use case for a collaborative effort such as this? So Chris. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. So as you mentioned, the group did acknowledge that there are multiple exciting use cases for, for CTDNA in, in early stage cancer. But as, as you mentioned, we, we focused in on um, charting the path forward for evaluating CTDNA kinetics as an early endpoint in, in the white paper. Uh, so what we mean by this is, can we use changes in circulating tumor DNA levels following initial treatment uh, of patients with early stage cancer to predict longer term endpoints? Uh, the reasons we focused on this particular endpoint are multifold. Um, so there does remain a clear need within the community to have access to better response biomarkers in the early stage setting. From a clinical perspective, uh, we obviously can't use imaging in, in the adjuvant setting to tell if our patients are responding to treatment or not. So having access to a non-invasive blood-based biomarker in the setting could help us manage these patients better uh, as Dr. Hellman referred to, have more precise information about what, what's happening in an individual patient. But also from a regulatory perspective, if we were confident that a change in CTDNA levels could identify patients who are going to experience long-term benefit from an early stage, um, from an early uh, stage intervention, then that could give us the confidence to um, have these patients, have patients get access to novel therapeutics earlier um, when we, we can see that those therapeutics are efficacious based on this early endpoint rather than having to wait for gold standard endpoints such as OS to mature. So, so based on the, these findings, the, the team did align that there's huge potential for CTDNA kinetics to be used as an early readout of treatment efficacy. However, we, we did acknowledge that there are challenges to use CTDNA in, in this way. Um, both from a clinical and technical perspective, and, th and this also drove us to explore, explore um, this use case of CTDNA. And, and in the white paper, we lay out potential solutions to these challenges, i.e. can we um, request key data elements from, tr from trials so that when we have data supporting um, 
gtdna kinetics being associated with endpoints that we can pull multiple trials together and perform meta-analyses so we have a confidence evidence confident so we have confidence in our evidence base uh, to use ctdna in the, in the, for this use um, and I think just to finish up, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that patients who have early stage cancer can potentially be um, cured with, with interventions such as surgery and our systemic therapies, whereas in the metastatic setting, cure is much harder to achieve. So uh, if we have this route to use ctDNA um, as an early endpoint to, to accelerate and optimise drug development in the early stage space, we, we should definitely be pursuing this. And I think this was another key driver in, in assessing ctDNA um, for this intended use. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, great. Um, just to continue uh, the discussion about the, the use case a little bit longer, um, the term early endpoint was used in this white paper. And I'm going to direct this question over to FDA and um, ask Paz to address this question. We hear, we hear reference to um, different terminology for endpoints you know we've heard surrogate endpoint intermediate endpoint and early endpoints and we've heard early endpoints actually used in different ways um if you can talk a little bit about why why this team decided to use the term early endpoint and and maybe talk a little bit about um what this means from an industry standpoint uh, or from an fda standpoint about establishing an early endpoint for this particular use case as if you can take this question Sure, thank you. Um, so yes, we use the terminology early endpoint for the use of ctDNA simply to reflect that it's measured earlier than overall survival or disease-free survival or event-free survival. And the term surrogate can be misleading as a true surrogate is something that has an established relationship with the treatment and also is established to predict long-term outcomes such as survival. So the bar for a true surrogate endpoint is quite high and requires rigorous statistical validation. So with this group and with the white paper, we discussed a number of supportive regulatory uses for ctDNA, including use as an enrichment biomarker to identify high-risk populations or low-risk populations in a clinical trial, and then also as a potential endpoint to support an accelerated approval being reasonably likely to predict clinical benefits. And so as Chris already has pointed out, there are many clinical and technical issues regarding the use of ctDNA as an early endpoint, and we will need to generate robust data um, and evidence in order to support its use for an accelerated approval. Thank you, Paz, that was helpful. And now shifting gears just a little bit, and let's talk about the roadmap that we've been talking about to establish CTNA as an early endpoint. And Paz, you just you know, mentioned the, you know, the, robot, the need for robust data. Um, I'm gonna ask for a couple different perspectives on this next question. The white paper outlines some of the challenges around generating this robust evidence to establish CTNA as an early endpoint, specifically um, around leveraging data across industry. So I'm gonna just go around and ask a couple different people to talk a little bit and very briefly about some of the challenges that you see um, with, with generating this, this data and maybe at the end um, to kind of talk about what, what do you see as one of the main benefits of taking a more collaborative approach to address some of these challenges? Um, let's go ahead and start with John, um, if you can comment on this briefly. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. So a great example of collaboration is the step one of the CTDA monitoring for treatment response. And that was sponsored by Friends of Cancer Research at I mean, here we address the utilization of CTNA for molecular profiling in the metastatic setting. And this work provided the framework of how collaboration among clinical and academic leaders, government, industry, and leading advocates can come together to investigate how changes in CTNA are associated with treatment response. So as discussed, the use of CTNA in the early disease setting may help expedite drug development to get effective therapies uh, to patients faster. That said, the implementation of CTNA in the early setting has a number of technological challenges, including platform sensitivity, a multitude of differing omnic approaches um, being, you know, that are being explored, including the use of somatic uh, mutations, methylations, or combination thereof, and variations in the prevalence of CTNA among the stage and, and tumor type. So as important is the evidence generation that is required to compel clinicians to adopt the technology. So pharma sponsors and individual diagnostics providers alike, they may question the value of the consortia as they believe that a competitive edge may be lost or that the consortia will slow down efforts internally and often overlook 
what it may take to influence the community as a whole. And then through, you know, through my experiences in consortia and what I've observed in the late stage disease setting is that consortia, it can be very influential and help diagnostic providers and pharma alike from both the standardization standpoint in the near term, and it can also provide objective proof uh, to the health authorities and, and the clinical community alike uh, through evidence generation in the long term. So I believe that through this initiative, we'll, we can make some inroads to support the use of CDNA kinetics as an early answer in early stage disease to support this use in regulatory decision making. Thank you, John. Um, Mark, do you wanna give us some thoughts on this question as well? Yeah, thanks, Kathy. So I'll, I'll speak from a, a technology and, and diagnostics perspective and, and maybe focus on a few challenges for leveraging analytical and, and clinical data across industry, um, you know, really specifically related to, to emerging CTDNA based approaches, which, you know, on the one hand, have really enabled some of the large scale retrospective analyses and early stage disease that, that Dr. Helmut highlighted, um, you know, and, and previously had discussed. Uh, but also really highlight how quickly the, the field is evolving. So um, there's really now a, a wide spectrum of technologies that have been developed for evaluating a variety of different cell-free DNA features, uh, sequence alterations, structural changes, methylation patterns, fragmentation patterns, and, and even non-cell-free DNA-based analytes, including protein biomarkers, for example. Uh, with some of these platforms being tumor-guided and bespoke, bespoke others being uh, plasma-only based methods. So really in order to, to bring together data sets uh, that have been generated across diagnostic platforms and clinical studies, uh, we'll need to, to think about it how best to harmonize minimal pre-analytical requirements, such as how whole blood samples and plasma samples are collected and processed, as well as downstream analytical factors, uh, such as how ctDNA is defined and quantified across different diagnostic platforms, uh, together with the analytical performance of, of different approaches uh, such that we can maintain integrity of the, of the clinical data across different um, uh, clinical trials. Um, but, but really, if we can do this, the benefit is to several fold through a collaborative approach, uh, such that we can understand the value of CTDNA as an early endpoint across tumor types and different therapeutic settings. Thank you, Mark. And, and maybe uh, just one more, uh, one more perspective on this, um, also maybe from an academic perspective, um, what are your thoughts on some of the challenges and opportunities here? Absolutely. Thanks, Kathy. And I think uh, John and, and Mark very nicely talked about the, the clinical and technical or analytical uh, challenges. What I would like to, to, to highlight um, is some aspects that have to do with next generation sequencing platforms and downstream analysis. And of course, as we already talked about, CTDNA and GS assays have different sensitivities, different levels of detection, in general, different analytical performance. Um, and there's also inherent challenges with liquid biopsies that are actually independent of the technology for CTDNA detection, such as distinction between bona fide tumor-derived CTDNA mutations from clonal hematopoiesis mutations that are also detected in, in plasma. And thus far, uh, CTDNA analysis for uh, patients with early stage uh, cancer have been generated from, from small or relatively small uh, sized cohorts, uh, for the most part using non-harmonized clinical variables and different ctDNA uh, collection and anal analytical uh, approaches. Uh, and certainly we talked about uh, uh, using different uh, response assessments. And, and, and this fragmentation and variability uh, can affect important definitions. Uh, for example, what is ctDNA response? Is it reduction beyond a specific threshold? Is it clearance? When is the optimal uh, timing of ctDNA response? And so, but what I also wanted to point out here is that understanding all of these challenges, uh, be it clinical, be it technical, this is a huge step forward uh, and provide a tremendous opportunity to leverage this knowledge and come up uh, with harmonization efforts to address this fragmentation and ultimately move the field forward. And what we need here is large scale validation efforts like, like the Friends of Cancer CD Monitor initiatives uh, that pool data from uh, across industry and academic institutions and can accelerate the use of ctDNA as an early endpoint for, for patients with, uh, with early stage uh, disease. Um, learning from these aggregated data sets can, can can help us, uh, for example, generate uh, technical gold, gold standards uh, and devise statistical analysis frameworks 
And importantly, bring us all together, bring all the stakeholders together from industry, academia, uh, and the FDA. And this can truly accelerate the use of ctDNA in clinical cancer care in general. Thank you, Elsa. That's um, interesting perspectives on all of that. And before we move on to that, we're going to dive a little bit more into the, some of the specific questions, uh, clinical questions. Uh, Paz, you, you talked a little bit on your in your earth opening remarks, um, you addressed this a bit. Uh, maybe just quickly before we move off this topic, do you see any, um, maybe any unique opportunities with this effort um, to move this forward? People have outlined a lot of the challenges. Um, do you see some, some unique opportunities with this effort? Yeah, so thanks for that question. So, um, you know, as pointed out already, there are a number of challenges, but I do want to say that at the FDA, we are very excited about the use of cpDNA, and we do see that there is promise for its use as a supportive endpoint. So um, while we're talking about looking at data potentially from completed trials or ongoing trials, um, and there may be some difficulty pooling together data um, given differences in clinical parameters and trial designs and methodology and diagnostic platforms used for cpDNA collection and analysis in those settings, we have an opportunity here to, to, first of all, work through some of those issues regarding existing data, but we also have an opportunity with prospective trials um, to, again, harmonize and standardize cpDNA practices prior before we initiate prospective trials so that we can eventually pull some of this data a little bit more effectively. So I see that there's a lot of great opportunity here as well. Great, thank you, Paz. And so we can just move on a little bit more to some of the um, discussions we had around the specific clinical questions and the specific analytical questions we may need to um, address as part of this roadmap. Um, perhaps, Chris, I'm going to go back to you. You you start you addressed a little bit of this in your opening statement, um, but maybe you can talk in a little bit more detail and give some examples of what do you see as some of the key clinical questions that will need to be addressed. Um, as part of this effort, and and I know you started to address this in your opening remarks, but you know how do you see some of the approaches we might we might take to start addressing these questions? If you can just expand on what you started um, at the beginning a little bit more. Yeah, sure. So when when we're looking to assess um, ctDNA kinetics as an endpoint of treatment efficacy, the first thing we we clearly need is data supporting an association of ctDNA reduction with um, survival endpoints such as disease-free survival or overall survival. We have seen some exciting data already, but very preliminary data from Checkmate 816, for example, that showed that clearance of ctDNA during neoadjuvant therapy can predict pathological complete response with chemo-immunotherapy combination. But, but ideally, we'd be seeing that, that ctDNA clearance could impact event-free survival in that, in that context, for example. So, so I think um, that that's a, obviously a key point. Um, to add an extra layer of complexity, the the association of ctDNA response with survival endpoints might vary by therapeutic class. So we may see that a decline in ctDNA with um, chemotherapy has very different connotation in terms of impacting survival to a decline in ctDNA with immunotherapy. So I have to explore. Um, ctDNA response in these different contexts. We need to align as a community on what we define as a ctDNA response. Um, so currently there are lots of different definitions, clearance of ctDNA, 50% decline in ctDNA. We need to align on when we should be monitoring patients at what time points in our, in our clinical trials. So, so there's obviously a lot of learning that we need to do as a community about how to best leverage this biomarker in an early stage setting. And how, how do we get there? Well, I think, I think the white paper was a good first step. Um, we've laid out some of the challenges. Uh, I think the, ne the next step is to um, evaluate the landscape of, of data that's already out there to see what, what learnings we can take from that. And then as we, we've started to discuss, to define key data elements that we need in, in clinical trials. Um, and that, that means down, down the road, when we have survival data available, we, we can pull our, our learnings across organizations. So, so I think by being proactive now um, and understanding that it takes a long time to generate these data, when the data comes out, we'll be in a strong position um, to, to be confident in use of ctDNA as, as an early endpoint. So that's the aim. 
Thank you, Chris. Chris, and I'm going to ask a, a similar question, and I'm going to direct this question to Rena because um, we noted in the white paper that it's not just the clinical questions. It's, there are, are a number of technical, and we've heard a, a number, a few people speak to this already. There are going to be a number of technical or analytical uh, challenges and questions that are going to need to be addressed as part of this effort. And um, we heard uh, a few people already talk about this. Rena, maybe from an FDA standpoint, what are what are the um, some of the key analytical questions that you see um, us having to address with this effort? Um, and and where do you think we're going to need better or more proactive alignment to address these um, questions? I'm going to turn that over to Rena. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Actually, the question is connected. You know, where what are the questions, and where do you need the alignment? So uh, Mark um, and Chris talked about a lot of challenges how with the uh, CTDNA assays in general, um, but you know there are some of these challenges have already been addressed in the earlier project. But I want to emphasize uh, just not on the analytical, but there is alignment needs to be done on the pre-analytical. But sometimes you know people forget about the pre-analytical aspects, which is very important in the CTDNA assay. You know, is to ensure that there is uniform blood collection, handling, processing, and what are the types of uh, blood collection tubes that are used across the assays, whether you can um, pool uh, the data that is coming from different trials because the, the collection was much different. So, and then moving on to the, um, the collection, uh, is there any consistent sampling? For example, you know, the, the timing the sponsor intends to sample from patients because um, you know the timing could be different uh, for different disease characteristics or uh, could be uh, different based on the tumor biology. So there may be a consistent sampling time point that should be pre-specified. And um, if you're trying to pull from different uh, trials, whether the timing of these collection was consistent or whether you'll be able to pull them because the timings were different. So that's another a uh, major question I think one needs to address. And uh, we already talked about, I think uh, a lot of, um, you know, previous panelists talked about the, the definition of MRD uh, negativity. Um, before one um, going to pull samples from multiple clinical trials, I think there should be a harmonized clinically valid definition of the MRD negativity because, um, you know, sponsors use different, um, uh, metrics, um, allelic frequencies, some use mutant molecules. So, is, you know, can you actually come up with um, a harmonized, clinically valid definition of MRD negativity? So that's uh, another key question. And um, with regards to CTDNA, there is always issue with clinical samples. So is there a way for, as part of this project, is there a way to come up with developing maybe some sort of cell lines that uh, could be, or you know, other reference materials that could be used for um, comparing the performance of the different assays, because as um, you know, Mark and others mentioned earlier, there are different types of assays, tumor informed, tumor naive. So um, you know, there, all, all these actually could come up with different answers, but is there a way to come up with uh, some sort of reference materials then so you can compare the performance of the different assays? Um, so, um, and then there are, you know, other additional aspects of the analytical validation that uh, one needs to address before you are trying to pull the data from multiple clinical trials. Thank you, Rena. And I think, um, you know, in, in listening to both Chris and Rena, um, it's really clear that this is going to be a huge effort across multiple companies <laughs> to even sort out all of the questions that are going to need to be um, addressed. So this is going to be, a, you know, obviously a long haul effort. Uh, to try and organize this information and figure out how do we um, develop that roadmap more fully. So we have a, just a couple of minutes left. Um, so maybe just moving towards it, you know, the title of the session is Charting the Path for CTDA as an Early Endpoint. And we've just heard from um, Rena and Chris, you know, there are a lot of questions that we're going to have to answer. And there are um, a lot of challenges. We talked about that earlier in the session. There are going to be a lot of challenges 
So maybe for the final question, um, what are maybe uh, Mark and John, maybe you can address some of the immediate next steps. Um, it's kind of some, sometimes hard to figure out how to get started on this stuff. So if you can talk about you know, some immediate next steps that this team can take um, in, to close out the session. Mark, yeah, sure. you go ahead and go first. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, thank you. So, I, and I think really, you know, what we expect from, from this framework that, that was outlined in the discussion today and, and within the white paper is this is, is really just an initial starting point for how we can bring together, you know, as Chris outlined, a lot of the existing data sets that, that are, are available and have been, been published today. Um, and, and you use that to establish the minimum analytical, technical, and, and clinical data requirements to, to expand into prospective studies to, to evaluate CTDNA as an early endpoint. Um, you know, it will, it will require collaboration across academia, industry, regulatory agencies, um, but, but as been, has been outlined um, in, in prior uh, discussions, there's, there's really been a lot of successful um, examples of this um, and what's been previously appro been approached by the Friends of Cancer Research through the late stage CT monitor effort. Um, and so I think, you know, all of us here today, you know, share an excitement about this compelling opportunity to utilize CTDNA such that we can bring more effective therapeutic options to patients sooner um, and, and hope that as the next steps of this project gain momentum, we can find on the participation of the broader healthcare community that's, that joins us today. Thank you, Mark and John, you're going to have the last word on this. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I think as Mark said, well, I mean, there's a lot of studies out there that have been that have been generated already in early stage disease, you know, but generalizing the, the, those those studies and be able to understand, you know, how we can utilize the different methods of, of CTDA analysis, it, it becomes difficult um, based on the fact that none of these studies had different ways of analyzing CTDA, the blood collection time points vary, there's heterogeneity, heterogeneity in the patient populations themselves that are being discussed that are being investigated and just how they calculate the CTDNA changes over time. So, I mean, similar to what we observed in step one, uh, there was a need in early stage disease for a standardized approach to assess the role of CTDNA as a potential tool, as well as to develop a robust data set for evaluating the relationship with CTDNA and outcomes. And then, you know, through this consortia, we can leverage those re retrospective data sets um, from the from the varying pharma partners and compare the different uh, CTA metrics to identify those that yield the most consistent and robust associations across multiple different technologies. It's going to be a little bit more complex in the early stage because the amount of emerging technologies that are coming online today um, are far greater than what we experience in the metastatic uh, disease setting in the in step one. Uh, but, you know, overall goal is that uh, we can align and help standardize approaches for those future clinical trials. Thank you, John. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and close out the discussion. I would like to really thank the panelists for sharing their thoughts and your expertise with all of us today. Um, I would like to end by really sincerely thanking friends for leading not only this this effort, the early stage effort that we've been discussing today, but uh, you know the overall leadership and vision around this entire effort. You know, we've talked about CT Monitor as well today. Um, they've kept these CT efforts moving forward in such a collaborative way, and we've got a lot of um, cross industry, uh, health authorities, academics. Uh, on board with this. So um, just really want to thank them for leading this effort. And uh, again, as you heard the panelists state today, um, it's only by working together that we're going to realize the full potential of CTDNA in cancer research and patient care. So a huge thanks. And I'm going to turn this over to Jeff right on time. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Kathy. And thank you to all of today's speakers and panelists for your thoughtful presentation and continued collaboration to drive this exciting field forward. Please join us tomorrow, again starting at 12 noon, for day two of our annual meeting. We'll be featuring the discussion of a second white paper regarding dose optimization and then be joined for a roundtable with FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence key leadership. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>